Today, we're doing a deep dive into the Bible, the book of Psalms. I'm so excited for you to join us. Stay tuned. Different Christian perspectives coming together to have important conversations about our faith and help you live in the fullness of life God wants for you each and every day. This is The Full Life with Joseph Mancuso, Carolyn Pankella, Hank Johnson, and Tina Webb. Come join the conversation. If you haven't been with us before, this is the show that wants you to live just that, wants you to live life to the fullest, the abundant life that God wants for you. And we do that every episode by refining our faith together, talking about topics in culture, the Bible, and really strengthening and refining our faith in God. And I have to say, we come with our own stuff. If you think that we're, uh, we're strong in our faith and that we uh, have it all together, let me just say, we do not. Uh, and I will speak for myself at least. This morning was a really tough morning with the children and as we were getting out to school, and I'm sure that's a hard thing for a lot of people. Getting out to school is a tough time. And I will say that I actually thought of the Psalms during that. I thought of Psalm 118 and, and how the, this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And after uh, struggling to get out, all of us, we all said it in the car because I was determined to turn this around. So it's perfect for today's discussion and I can't wait for everyone to share their reflections on the Psalms, but I just want to say we're with you. Every episode, we're with you because we're learning and growing with you. So don't stay with us and don't give up. And with that, I'm going to bring in everyone else. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Sounds like Hello. you are joining, Joseph. Well, you know, it's kind of every, it's kind of once a week at least. But today, I, given that we were going to talk about this, it was on my mind and I heard on the way out of the school, you're going to mm -hmm. talk about this today. And I said, okay, I'm going to talk about it today. <laughs> So um, with that said, I want to start today with our conversation on the Psalms. What Psalms have been meaningful for you in your lives? Any emotion that you feel, you can find it in the Psalms. Um, anything that you've worried about or thought about, you can find it in the Psalms. Every um, part of life, probably, you can find it in the Psalms. Um, for me, it's been deeply personal. Um, but also very reflective. So for the last year, I lead a prayer group. And before every prayer, we do a psalm together, just thinking and reflecting on it. Um, but also there's psalms like Psalm 23, which was a great reminder that God watches over me and he's my shepherd, you know, pastor, protector, provider. Psalm 139, to let me know God's always there and God's with me. Um, psalm 100, to give praise to the Lord. So yeah, the psalms are, are deeply meaningful to me, just like many Christians um, and God's people for all time. So I, I really, really do love the Psalms. I love the Psalms. Maris fact, when you just asked that, I just, Psalms 23, if I can just say it, because I think it's going to minister to people watching. The Lord is my shepherd. Wow. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his same namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I mean, you can just listen to these words and, and it just soothes you. I don't know if it does you, but it just does because I love David. I, I love, I, he wrote so many of them and I love it because I relate to him because one minute he's crying and crying out to God, where are you? How can you let me go through this? And next second he's, but God, you are the greatest. You are the man. You can bring us through again. And I just think we all can relate to the Psalms. I love the Psalms too, like everyone else. I remember being a young believer and the Psalm was, the Psalms were the book that I could most easily relate to and understand. Um, mm -hmm. Two particular uh, verses or passages have really, really resonated with my life. And Hank, you already mentioned one, Psalm 1, 139. The whole passage is rich. Uh, it is so meaningful and there's so much depth of meaning. For example, in first verse 17, when it says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. And it's so healing. I use this passage and another verse, Psalm 46, verse 10, which is be still and know that I am God. I use those two quite a bit when I do mentoring for moms, because, you know, in the midst of 
busy life and kids, like you mentioned, Joseph, you had a rough morning. Uh, we all can relate to those rough mornings or nights with our kids. And uh, but to know uh, God's pleasure, to know that he's with us. And in Psalm 46, 10, to know, be still, silence ourselves. Let's quiet ourselves in the presence mm -hmm. of God and experience his peace and his goodness. And sometimes we just have to leave the room and take a moment. <laughs> you know, uh, it's just, it, it's so relevant. It's so real. And, you know, everyone loves the Psalms. Well, just like all of us, another person who is in love with the Psalms and helped write a book about the Psalms and the reflections on them is today's guest. Laura L. Smith is a popular speaker and best-selling author. Smith speaks around the country, sharing the love of Christ with women at conferences and events. She lives in the college town of Oxford, Ohio, with her husband and her four kids. And she is primed to release her new book, Restore My Soul. Please welcome our guest today, Laura L. Smith. Hey, Laura. Hey, Laura. <laughs> Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Well, Laura, thank you so much for this book and your reflection on the Psalms. Before we get dive into the book, though, I want to talk a little bit about you and your story. I mean, I imagine a lot of people know you from your, from your book, but in case they don't, tell us a little bit about your story, how you came to know God, and how you came to be the Bible teacher and author you are today. Sure. Um, I grew up in a family that went to church every Sunday. Um, but we never talked about God or what that meant in our lives. Um, we would pray, God is great, God is good before we ate dinner. And we would pray, now I lay me down to sleep before we went to bed. And like I said, we went to church on Sundays, but that was it. Um, I went to horseback riding camp and junior high because I thought horses were cool. And it ended up being a Christian horseback riding camp. And yeah. that is where I really fell in love with Jesus. Yeah. There was an altar call the last night of camp and as cheesy or cliche as it sounds at camp to like go up to the altar. That's what happened. I felt a tug in my heart to literally move forward. And um, I felt an emptying out of my previous self and just a whole new, beautiful awesomeness wash over me. Wow. Um, which was spectacular. And I would like to say that that stuck forever, but, um, I went into high school and I, my father had left our home multiple times and I really felt like I needed to prove myself. And so even though I believed in Jesus that, um, because I believed in him, I would go to heaven one day. I didn't really believe that I was fully loved, which is a promise mm -hmm. that God makes to us that we are, but I didn't. I didn't believe that um, a little girl doesn't understand her dad leaving means he has things he's dealing with. I, it, to me, it was like, he was leaving me. Like I wasn't good enough. Like if I only was better at this or could earn this or do that. So I spent um, most of high school and college and even the couple of years right after college doing anything and everything to try to gain people's approval. Um, I fell into a lot of bad situations because I just was craving love and acceptance and didn't really think I was worthy of it. Um, because God is good and he chases us down and he never gives up on us. Um, he came after me and um, really showed me um, when I was in my mid twenties, he um, brought my husband to me. We'd been friends in college. My husband showed me what perfect love looks like and that I actually could be loved for me. Like since we'd been friends, he knew all of my ugly and loved me anyway. And I didn't think that was possible. Um, and wow. we were both people who had grown, grown up in the church and kind of fallen away from it. And together, God brought us to each other and back to him all in one beautiful fairy tale oh. kind of thing. I think your message, and I think this book is so timely because I think we, I was just talking about it with a girlfriend this morning in our prayer time that it just seems like there's such a heaviness around it, you know, it just seems like everything you do, it's just like you're pulling through sludge sometimes. And when I get in the word, and I think that's what you were saying too, Joseph, it's something about when you start hearing the word, it just washes over you a peace. And so I think it's so timely that you're doing this book about the song. So thank you for doing that. Um, your last book, How Sweet the Sound, mm -hmm. uh, had a similar structure um, and was based off the hymns, which I love the hymns too. I do too. I just, <laughs> the new book is called Restore My Soul and is centered on the Psalms, which we love. Tell us why you were drawn to the Psalms and the inspiration for the restoration of souls in today's world, which I think is awesome. Sure. I mean, 
as you guys said before I joined you, like the Psalms are so beautiful. I mean, there are this song book written thousands and thousands of years ago that still totally apply to our lives. And I even think of like songs that we listen to in high school and how terrible they are now, right? Like there are so few songs that are this timeless um, and they're this timeless because they're truth. And mm. they really give us this permission to come to God. As you guys were saying, no matter how we are, like we don't have to clean ourselves up before God and like be totally on with his plan. Sometimes the psalmists are like, why is this happening? Like, why have you done this, God? Why have you not <laughs> answered my prayers? Why have you left me? And the Psalms give us permission to come to God as we are mm -hmm. with our real emotions, with our real feelings. Um, and then they're just packed with all these beautiful promises that he never forsakes us, that his love endures forever, that his hand is always upon us, that he knows our very thoughts, that, you know, that he restores our very souls. And I, I think this is true for all time. It was thousands of years ago when these were written. But in our culture today, where social media is screaming at us that we need to be or act a certain way, um, when there's so much turmoil in our world um, between racism and political unrest and the war in Ukraine, like we're hungry for restoration. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus was a carpenter. Um, I think he's in the restoration business. I, mm. I think that's what he does. And um he wants to offer us peace and love and joy and hope and strength and security in him. And I think that's what we're all craving, right? I, if I, if you talk to anyone, they'd be like, oh, I could just have some peace. If I just have some security, if I could just hope in something like, you know, that's what everyone's asking for. And Jesus offers it all to us. And the Psalms show us how we can find it. Yeah. Well, I think there's 150 total Psalms. Um, so it might be a lot for one book. But we're just curious if you'd like to share, um, how did you select the Psalms you selected? Um, what was that process like um, as you put the book together? Sure. So I picked 30 um, mainly so that it would be something people could read, <laughs> like 150. I think it would be a lot. Um, but I started with picking on my favorites. And some of them are the ones you guys already mentioned, Psalm you know, 23 and Psalm 139. For me, Psalm 16, Psalm 121. Some of these are my all-time favorites, Psalm 40. Um, so I started with all my favorites. It's like they had to be in there, right? And then as I kind of started like praying through and going through my daily life, I just was talking to God about what he was impressing upon me in those seasons. Um, and I tried to give a variety of emotions so that um, they weren't all songs of psalms of praise. They right. weren't all psalms of despair, mm -hmm. that we got a variety of the different ways that God is there for us. Because like even Psalm 150 is so awesome that it is about praising God in our celebrations. Right. Like we can't forget to do that, too. Um, mm -hmm. I think part of our culture day, too, is we're so worried about what's next that we don't even enjoy what we're doing right now. Um, and Psalm 150 is like, you know, dance with timbrels and cymbals and not just playing cymbals, but clanging cymbals and like, like go all out when God gives you something good and really celebrate and honor that. So um, I did want to show all those different emotions in the book. So I took 30 of my favorite Psalms and then a variety of emotions we could come to God with or situations. And then I related them all to like a personal situation in my life or in culture to say, Hey, these are relevant today to the lives we're living as a mom or a wife or someone who has a job or, you know, a friend or a family, like these are all relevant to today. You know, you even say, you know, it's like a radio playlist, you know, all sorts of songs for all sorts of moods. And then you even said all sorts of questions that we come to God with. Um, but let's start with Psalm 1. You mentioned that there's a reason why it's first. So can you share uh, with the listeners uh, why it's first and what can we learn about the first chapter of Psalms? Sure. Yeah. Psalm 1 is beautiful. Um, yeah, it wasn't necessarily written first, um, but it was put in at the beginning of the song book of Psalms to say, OK, this is why this matters. Um, and it talks all about the person who plants themselves in God's word that they will not wither, um, that they can be restored, that this, you know, if you are planted by God, it doesn't matter how dry the land is because your roots are going to go down into that living water that God has. So it doesn't matter what's going on out here. It doesn't matter what the weather is or the circumstances or any situation because your roots can get that living water um, no matter where you are. So like putting ourselves in this word, like that is what makes all the difference. Um, so putting that at the beginning of the psalm book says, see, don't you want to read it and see what's inside? Like, <laughs> this is going to change your life. Like, if you think of all the books on Amazon, like the top sellers, they're all like, 
you know, how to simplify your life, how to live a more effective life, how to, you know, find peace, how to find joy. And, and the Psalms can give us that the Bible can give us this. And that's what Psalm one is basically saying, like, do you want to change your life? Read my living word. I love one thing you mentioned in, and when you, in your reflection was you, uh, it was to understand him in order to thrill in him. I mean, the idea of thrilling in God is, is very exciting to me. I think that is a very um, emotive way of talking about what your relationship with God can be. Yeah, for sure. And he sure. offers that to us, right? Like he offers us so much to delight in every day. Um, right now, just it's gorgeous outside. All the flowers are blooming and it's insane. Like how different an iris is from a knockout rose from a pansy, like that God created all those different flowers and all those different shapes and makes them all bloom is insane. I mean, it just, it does something to my spirit. I, I love what you're doing. Um, but in Psalms 8, you discuss how God created us, which I love, how he made us just lesser than the angels. And you said, in essence, he created us in purpose and authority. I love that. I want you to just to talk to us a little bit today about how we might rest in that authority and that purpose. What we're just talking about, that God is with us. Psalm 8, verse 5 and 6, that saying, God, you've only made humans a little lower than the angels and you've crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. You guys were crowned with glory and honor. Like when was the last time you walked into a room and thought that like, oh, you know me, I'm crowned with glory and honor, right? No, you're where it's always like, oh, do I fit in here? Do those people know more than I do? Um, do they know more people than I do? But no, we're crowned with glory and honor and God says that we're the rulers over the works of our hands, that he puts everything under our feet. Um, mm -hmm. God gives us the authority to do anything that he wants to be done. He gives us wisdom when we need it. He shuts our mouths when we need that. He introduces the right person to us when we need it. And I think we're so burdened with having to do everything right. I know this is something I struggle with. I was talking to my husband this morning, like, what can we be praying about for each other this week? And this week we have um, one of my daughter's high school graduations. Um, mm. My oldest daughter is coming in town for it. Um, I also have a lot of stuff going on for launching this book. So I'm like, okay, I have work stuff. And my one daughter's coming home. I want it to be perfect for her. My mom's coming in. I want it to be perfect for her. I want the graduation to be perfect for my daughter who's graduating. Um, and I put all this pressure that I have to make all those things perfect. But God's saying, I gave you everything you need. Like everything that, that needs to get done, I'll go under your feet. I've given you the authority to get done what needs to get done. And like, we don't have to worry about being perfect because we're not, you know, his grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in our weakness. Um, but also we don't ever have to be afraid to do the things he calls us to do or step into the places he calls us to step into or into the conversations because he's given us authority and he's crowned us with glory and honor. And that's so beautiful. Um, I want to talk about Psalm 12 because I think this really resonates with me and the sort of trust and how it deals with trust and relationships and people telling the truth and being authentic. Um, I think I always sort of feel like everyone has, has some sort of angle or agenda of their own and, and rightly or wrongly or, in, you know, or w whether it's malintent or not, I think everyone has their own thing. So how does the Psalm sort of instruct us to deal with this and how can we, how do we stay in our truth? Like when do we stay in truth uh, 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 and push forward? When do we stay, you know, how do we navigate that? Yeah, it's like not easy. It's easier said than done, yeah. right? Yes, um, really I think we is. all want to tell the truth, but we all catch ourselves maybe exaggerating here and there or um, maybe covering up for ourselves something we feel shame about or guilt about. Um, and, and, and that's a hard thing, but Jesus says he is the truth. Um, so honestly, the more time we spend with him, the more we know what truth sounds like and we know how good it sounds, like how that rings. And I think this Psalm, you know, it, if we can pray it to ourselves, right? So it says like, may the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Like we can ask God to do that in ourselves. You know, God, please silence my flattering lips and my boastful tongue. I don't want to be like that, right? It says, but our tongues, we will prevail. Our own lips will defend us who is Lord over us. And God says, I will now arise, said the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver, 
purified in the crucible like gold, refined seven times. You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked. So even when people lie to us um, or lie about us, I mean, we can have such hope and faith because Jesus went through all of that too. So he would understand people lied about him all the time. People mm-hmm. lied to him all the time. He knows what it's like. Like if we can talk to anyone about it, we can talk to him and we can, we can pray to him and ask him through these times, how to get through these times. Cause it's, it's not mm-hmm. easy to be um, fully honest all the time. And it's not easy when people speak untruths to us. Well, I think one of the beautiful things about Psalm 23 is its richness and its depth. For example, David writes only from what he knows. So it's almost like you can imagine him being like, wait, I'm a shepherd that provides for my sheep. Wait, God's my shepherd, you know? Wait, I'm a king who, you know, have to sit in the midst of all my enemies. Wait, God's my king. Um, but one of my favorite parts is the end, right? Where it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Yeah. And being a warrior, he actually speaks to that because the word he uses for follow is radaf, which in the Hebrew means to chase you down until you're captured. Um, and then the word he used for goodness is hesed, which is the New Testament agape about this God's love that's always for your betterment, right? Um, so there's just so much depth in Psalm 23, but I kind of want to draw back to the beginning. Um, so you talk about how that famous phrase that starts with the Lord's my shepherd, there's nothing we should want um, as a prayer of contentment and peace, but also reinforcing this need for Sabbath and rest. Uh, can you speak to, uh, about any of that or yeah, speak about the Sabbath and rest, but then any other thoughts you have on Psalm 23? It is speaks so deeply to me and I've been stuck in it so, so much lately still, but I love that it says God makes us lay down in green pastures <laughs> um, because we just don't do it on our own. We won't rest. We don't rest. Like the whole culture we live in is all about the hustle. And I was talking to a friend recently and um, she's like, sleep's overrated. No, 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 it's not overrated. <laughs> like we need it. Um, <laughs> but everyone's trying to like, you know, it's the common answer when you ask someone how they are crazy busy is the answer. Great, but crazy busy. But God never intended us to be crazy busy. Um, He intended us to work. Like work is good. Work was in the garden before the fall. Um, Work is good. But on the seventh day, God rested, not because he was tired, but to model for us that we can rest, that this is good for us. We we don't think twice about going to bed at night and closing our eyes and, and, and saying to God, okay, I trust you'll take care of things till I wake up. But we do, as far as a Sabbath rhythm in our lives, we're like, oh, no, we can't take a day off this week because, you know, everything is going to fall down if I don't answer that email, if I don't do that thing, if I don't, you know, work on that project a little bit. Um, But God was trying to model to us from the beginning of time that, yeah, I mean, Jesus even says that, you know, the Sabbath was created for humans. Um, And God created this for us like this great gift, like. We're so excited if we get vacation days or whatever, but God's like, I'm giving you one every week. Why aren't you taking it? And when we don't, he's like, I'm going to make you lay down, you dumb sheep, because you're not. I'm going to make you lay down in great pastures. But Sabbath has become one of my favorite days. Like, I look forward to it so much every week because it's so peaceful. And then we can come to our work or our relationships or whatever we have in front of us from a place of rest instead of from a place of exhaustion. Um I know a lot of people talk about like they can't wait till they get a rest, but it's even better if we come from a place of rest instead of working to get a rest. I think for me, I love that you're bringing me back to the Psalms. and It's going to make me really dive into it even more is because um, if I can come from that place of rest, it it is going to make me better through the day. I mean, it's going to make me more of what God wants me to be, but I have to let go of the world's what they put on us. Is that okay to say that? I mean, you know, yeah. we've got to be doing, we've got to be, you know, and if you sit down, it's like, oh, you're lazy. I mean, I have to really, I'm trying to learn. I got to take off their labels and really begin to put on God's labels of, um, of who he says I am. And I can only do that by getting in the word and learning who he says that I am. Right. So that's the power of what you're saying. It's it's really good. I'm appreciating it for me, my, myself today. Yeah. I'm glad it's just important. I mean, I think it's in that first line of the Psalm too. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, meaning if I don't do these things today, and by the way, you don't have to Sabbath on Sunday. If you work on Sunday, Sabbath a different day of the week. Like you can, right. you can Sabbath whenever you want. Like God just wants you to take a day off. Um, I think that's important for people to know too. Um, 
And if you can't take a full day, start with an hour, start with yeah, yeah. two hours, just, just try to give up something to the Lord. Because when we do, we find out that we shall not want. Right. Really I think the good. other thing on rest too, real quick, is that like, for especially people who work on weekends, not just church people, right. um, not only can you take every, any other day and make it your, your Sabbath, but I also think it's good to practice taking two days off during the week and splitting it up over four days. So what I try to do is I take a day off um, and then that's my day off. But then because ministry happens at all different times, I, I schedule in the seven day work or seven day week, a morning where I'm completely off, an afternoon where I'm completely off and a night where I'm completely off. So then you're building into your schedule four different days and four different times of rest. Um, and it seems ancient and weird at first until you realize, especially for those of us in ministry, we don't get weekends. Um, so splitting it up over seven days and getting that four times off it's really, really good. Um, I had a mentor who gave that to me, so I just thought the need to share it as well um, in thinking of Sabbath, because for most of us, you have to plan the Sabbath or you don't do the Sabbath or take the Sabbath. Yeah, very much so. Good. You know, I think the fact that we all have been able to chime in really shows how relatable your book is, how relatable yeah. the specific Psalms that you picked and how relatable you are. You know, I love the fact that you brought yourself and you allowed yourself to be vulnerable and transparent uh, through the book with your stories, um, I there's a chapter on Psalm 32. And I'm going to quote something that you wrote. You said, there is triumph in telling the truth. And then you talk about a, a, a situation that happened, I think, at a conference. And you said, but all of us who dared to speak truth created a place where darkness got shut down because we let the light shine on it. And the light was contagious. And I love that. Yeah. Um, in that chapter in Psalm 32, you know, it echoes the words of Revelations 12, verse 11, which says, of course, you know, and they overcome him by overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And so this thing about testimony and sharing, can you just talk a little bit more about how it's important to share the challenges of overcoming what we've overcome and, and sharing our stories? Yeah, I... I fully believe that Satan wants us to keep all of our mistakes in the dark um, because when mm. we do um, they fester and we get a lot of guilt and shame about them. Um, but when we shine light on them and bring them out in the open, Satan doesn't have any power over them anymore. Um, he can't feed us lies about like the mistakes we've made and who that makes us because we're all beloved children of the one true King that's who we are, not our mistakes, not something that was done to us or something we did. Um, and when we keep all that stuff inside, then Satan keeps just slithering in and telling us another lie and making us feel bad about it again. But as soon as we tell someone we trust, and this doesn't mean like post on Facebook, like your biggest sin you've ever committed, um, <laughs> that like be careful with who you share with people who you really trust. Um, but share with people who you really trust. And I think we often find then that not only are we free from whatever we were hiding or harboring, but it frees other people because then another person is like, oh my gosh, I did that same thing in college or that same thing happened to me. And all of a sudden they who were keeping it in the dark can also pull it out into the light. And it's, it's just like chains are breaking left and right. Like there's so much freedom in that. You know, in a lot of ways, social media maybe is to blame, but the TMI, you know, generation, too much information. Uh, but, you know, you brought it out just now. You brought it out in your book that it's important to have that safe community. It's not just broadcast everything. You know, it's really uh, be, be wise and, and discreet, but share. Definitely. Well, and I, I, I think because we talk about testimony a lot, I, I thought we might take a moment on testimony. I think testimony involves God's work in your life. It's not, here's everything that happened to me today. I mean, that's that's not a testimony. So <laughs> just so we, we clarify what a testimony is. I mean, he could be working all day in your life and that may be, but I mean, it's not like I made an egg and then I did this and I'm posting this <laughs> thing that I did and I'm doing this dance. That's not your test. That's not a testimony, just so we're clear. <laughs> because I've seen that from other people and, you know, I don't, doesn't really add anything, you know, I'm glad you had fun, you know, cool. <laughs> but I want to talk about the concept of waiting. 
Um, and you had it in some, you talked about it in Psalm 90 and counting the days and waiting in anticipation. And I, I can, I'm sure there are countless people. I, I feel like I'm one of them in, in days where I, I don't trust as much as I need to, where I'm like, I want to be, I want to be somewhere. I want to do something. I want this to happen. Why isn't this happening? Even if you've heard it, even if you believe that you're in the, you know, in God's will, you're doing what God's want, you're in his purpose. Why isn't it happening? So talk to us about that and what Psalm 90 says. Um, it says, teach us to number our days <laughs> that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And um, we are in such a rush for everything. Me too. Um, I know if I can get through all this graduation stuff, then our family gets to go on vacation, right? So um, there's always these things like, and I have a friend whose husband is in the hospital and I am praying for his healing and it hasn't happened yet. And I'm gonna rush for him to be healed. Um, we always want things like this, but God's timing is better than our timing, thankfully. Um, he always knows what's best. And when we trust in him, and live this day to its fullest, what he's put in front of us today, because he gives us all this day. Like Joseph, you were saying at the beginning, you had to remind yourself, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. But we need to remember that because every day that's true. If we woke up and there is air in our lungs, um, then this is a day that God has given us. And I don't know what he has in store for you, but he has something amazing in store. It might be a conversation. It might be something you discover um, it might be something you read in your Bible. It doesn't have to be like some major, like I got a new job thing every day, right? But he's doing something in our lives every single day. So um, when we're so eager to have the next day happen, to have that thing resolved, to you know move to that next place, God is doing something. His timing is perfect. And I've seen it happen again and again in my life when the waiting has been um to have his perfect plan come to fruition. But in the in the waiting, we don't always see that. So we have to go back sometimes and be like, I've seen God do this before. Like, I know that if I am faithful to him, he is always faithful to me. And he is using this day for something. You know, he promises to use everything for our good and his glory. So he's using today, even the hard stuff, even the stuff that he didn't make happen, even the stuff that um, is just from a broken world or a set of circumstances, he's gonna use it for good. Our world is very polarized in a lot of respects, in a lot of ways. And there is the aspect of standing up and fighting for truth and and either waiting on God or essentially deciding on when is your time. Should you be involved? Should you not be involved? How should you be involved? And I think that's a big question for people about now, uh, how to live in that truth and and what is right for them and how they should live that so the first part is how do how, how do you see people navigating that i can't answer that for you but jesus can like god loves you so much and he has certain giftings that he's given you um that he hasn't given me and he's made some things more um stir in your heart more than they stir in mine. And he's put us in different locations and given us different resources. So um, all of us are called in different ways. And I think first we need to give each other grace and recognize um, that we don't have to do everything and <clears throat> that we shouldn't expect our friends or neighbors to necessarily um, get involved and interact in the same way that we are called to. So I think it's just a lot of praying and talking to God. I know an example that I give in the book is literally during the election, driving down the road, all the political signs. We live in Ohio, so it's a swing state. So we just get bombarded. If you guys don't live in swing states, that's just so different. Like we get all the political ads. Every single commercial is a political ad. The signs are just up and down the street for, um, you know, the different candidates and slamming the opposing candidates. Um, and it was just so much for me. I was just, I just felt too much, but I just started praying like, God, like, give me peace. I feel so like literally like ripped and torn. And it just seems so painful that people I care about are being so unkind to each other. And, um, and, you know, God has told me to pray for both parties and pray for all the candidates. And it just, it put this whole switch on me, like, instead of being like, oh, I can't believe these people think like this, or I can't believe everyone's so mad at each other. It's just starting praying for them. And that's what God put on my heart for that. But um, someone else you might've called to be at either of those rallies, someone else you might've called to put signs up, someone else you might've called to run for office or volunteer for one of those campaigns. Like um, 
we all have different, he, he makes us so different. That's what Psalm 139 says is that we're fearfully and wonderfully made that he stitched us all together. Like he made you like this and me like this. And um, he calls us all to react differently. So I think in these times of trouble, in these times in our world, just constant conversations with the father on how he wants us to act, react, pray, talk to is, is the best guide for anything. It goes back to Psalm one, like stick ourselves in the word and, and we will, we'll know our paths will be directed. And your final takeaways, what would you like people to get out of reading this book? I pray that they will know that God's love endures forever, that he says you are wonderfully made, that he knows your every thought and he loves you just the same, that he goes before you and behind you, that his hand is on you, that he is your night watchman that never slumbers nor sleeps, um, that he will protect you and keep you from evil and keep you from danger, that he loves you so much, that he bends down when you cry out. He inclines himself to you because he loves you so much. So I just pray that as people read this, that they they find the truth of how much God loves them. And then that they let that love sink in and live as if they are loved, as if they are crowned with glory. Because you all are. Because the God of the universe made you and loves you. And now let's turn to the fullness of prayer. When I first wake up in the morning, I open my eyes and I kind of think about what's going on in that day. And I try to just ask God, either thank him for something I know is going to happen or thank him for something that happened yesterday. And I try to ask him for guidance in the day ahead. Um, I journal about what I read in the Bible, like if what I read is true. So today I was reading about how the Lord was with Joseph and I just kept saying that. And I was like, gosh, thank you, God, for always being with me. And that started my prayers. And then I could thank him for ways he's been with me recently and ask for him to be with me in upcoming ways. So I use what I read in the Bible as a prayer prompt. Um, I also spend 15 minutes in my closet every day praying. Um, this is something that's fairly new to me, but actually going in and closing my door and setting the timer on my phone and t- then throwing my phone kind of across the closet for 15 minutes and being I'm away from any noise or any distraction and just literally letting God tell me what he wants to tell me. Or if I have a lot on my mind, just letting it all untangle there has been so life-giving to me. I will pray on the spot for just about anything. Um, If I get an email from someone, um, I will be often just like say a prayer to God for them and their work that they're doing. Um, if I run into you someplace and you tell me something's going on with you, I'll probably put my hand on you and ask you if I can pray for you. Um, I pray with my kids every night before they go to bed, even though they're teenagers, I still think it's important to remind them of who they are in Christ and remind them that God is with them in their journeys and their struggles. Life is hard and life is great. And, um, when we talk to Jesus about all of it, it's so much better. So I try to talk to him a lot. Your writing is beautiful. There are just some Mm -hmm. phrases, you know, as a writer, I commend you, you know, there are some phrases that I can tell the Holy Spirit just, just really used you. There's one that's my favorite. It says, uh, I can't see the wind, but I still believe in it. I still trust that when it blows, it can make leaves tumble or trees sway. And even though love has no outline or shape, I believe in and have fully experienced it. That's just wonderful. It's just beautiful language. And so I just, I thank you for your your art, your gift in the midst of the content. Thank you. You're super kind. But I just say that I take dictation. Um, I just let the Lord give me the words and I just sit and whatever he wants to say. So I can't take credit for any of it, but your words are super kind. Thank you so much. And where can they get your gift? Where can they get the book? Um, Restore My Soul, The Power and Purpose of 30 Psalms is available on Amazon and any other website that sells books, Target, Barnes & Noble, Christian book retailers, anywhere. Um, And my publisher, Our Daily Bread Publishing, it's also on their site as well. Just like everyone said, I mean, what I found so uh, striking about the Psalms every time I read it, and I I didn't yesterday too, and I was reading it, it's, it's almost like they start with, oh man, this is so hard. But, but I'm, I'm, I, he's assuring himself again. I mean, it's just so you see the, the struggle, like you see it's happening. I mean, like, it, it, so I want to say it in an encouraging way because that's well, I know when I pray, I'm like, God, you know, this was so hard. And then you see David affirm and 
kind of boosted himself up. Okay, now, now this I'm repeating the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. And 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 so if, if he had to do it, then we have to do it. So I encourage you all to continue to do that and really keep boosting yourself up with God's word because that's what Psalm 1 says. If we stay in the word, we'll be nourished with that living water. And we'll see you next time for more conversations here on The Full Life.